August 15th, 1971. I mean, it was just meant to be another chill Sunday for Americans. But what they didn't expect is that would be the date that their money would become worthless. And that would lead to the complete overhaul of the financial system. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets. An overhaul that's on the verge of being finalized today. And the scariest part is that it's led by one single organization. And this organization is above governments, private and central banks, and even controls 95% of the world's GDP. The year was 1971, perhaps the most pivotal year in recent history that you've never even heard of. Now you might be asking what exactly happened that year? And if it's so important, why does no one really know about it? Well, those were some of my central questions that began an investigation that would lead directly back to our favorite initiative, the Great Reset. So let's have a look at what actually happened in the year of 1971. Inflation soared, real wages were crippled, productivity and compensation were uncoupled. You see, the world took quite a turn in 1971. I mean, clearly wages started to decline drastically and things that were previously correlated completely lost correlation overnight. And that, my friend, was just the tip of the iceberg. There were far more profound structural changes happening in the background. Something carefully planned and extremely shady was set to happen that year. You see, 1971 was the year that your money officially became worthless. Now, you might say that your money still has value to this day, and you might be partially right. But the question is, why does it have value? You see, simply put, it's just because you believe it does. And that's the beauty and the curse of fiat currency. It works as long as everyone believes it works. I mean, it sounds almost religious. And all of that began in 1971. You see, prior to 1971, the government had to hold a certain amount of gold for every dollar they printed. You see, the dollar was backed by gold and you could redeem one ounce of gold for $35. And this ensured inflation was steady and made it so that money actually held value because you could always exchange it back for gold. The problem with this, it was extremely hard for the Fed to print more money when they had to put one ounce of gold as collateral for every $35 they printed. I mean, it would be much easier if they could just simply, I don't know, print money out of thin air. And that is exactly what they did and still do to this day. That was the first big event that happened in 1971. President Nixon severed ties between the dollar and its golden base, meaning the dollar was no longer convertible to gold. And that is the very thing that has led to the obscene devaluation of the American dollar ever since. Now, learning that led me to an inevitable question. Why? Why would the government tarnish their own currency's value by taking it off the gold standard? And the answer became apparent very quickly. As always, it's all about control. You see, at the time, the US dollar was pegged to gold and every other major currency was pegged to the dollar. So when England and France threatened to redeem their gold, the Fed was in trouble given their limited gold reserves. And at the same time, the US was facing a recession and was struggling to stimulate the economy because of the government's monetary policy. Because at the time, it was really just limited by the amount of gold they had. So the Fed needed a way out. They needed to boost their domestic economy and make sure the US remained the world's reserve currency. So they decided to go off the gold standard. And that meant that the government could now print unlimited money whenever they pleased to stimulate the economy and still keep their status as a global reserve currency. Now this eased the international pressure they were under and allowed the government to gain even more control because money essentially became debt that was secured by nothing except for your trust in the government. And that trust was something that they could abuse for their own gain. Now, if we think back to episode one, we know what happens when the government racks up debt, or rather, who gets rich off of government debt. So with an unbacked currency, there was no limit on how much money the government could print. No limit on how much debt that they could take on. And the effect? Well, you see, the puppet masters now effectively had unlimited money because of the push of a button, they could just simply make more. And so, they did. They expanded the money supply and continued devaluing the dollar tripling its purchasing power. And now that the dollar could be printed on demand, the Federal Reserve was more powerful than ever before. And the puppet masters now had complete reign over the US money supply with the right to print it on demand whenever they pleased. How much they wanted, whenever they wanted it. And that was the final move the puppet masters needed 
to push their great reset initiative. Why? Because now they had the ultimate mass control tool in their arsenal, inflation. Now you might be asking yourself, how does this all tie back to the World Economic Forum? What does this have to do with all of that? Well, funnily enough, another very important event happened to our timeline in 1971, the creation of the World Economic Forum, World Economic Forum in Kissinger. So who's really behind the World Economic Forum? Who are the masters of the future who Klaus Schwab refers to in this video? What does it need to master the future? I mean, we already know our buddy Klaus and his sinister intentions, but who else was involved? You see, as I kept looking into Schwab, the World Economic Forum, and the various crises, there was one name that kept popping up in the background. Now, we know that the World Economic Forum boasts that they are a private-public partnership. And we know the public part consists of every major government in the world. But who constitutes the private? As I kept looking into this list, it seemed to be endless. And I was able to dig up the list of attendees to this year's Davos conference. Name any major company. They had a representative there. I'm talking about the likes of Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, the CEO of Bayer, etc., etc. And that begged the question, why were they all there? Why did they feel the need to rub shoulders with all of these politicians? You see, as I was asking myself this, I remembered a quote I uncovered during my World War II research. A quote from none other than the grandfather of fascism and a ruthless dictator. You see, Mussolini once said that fascism should more properly be called corporatism since it's the merger of state and corporate power. You see, politics are kind of weird. We always think of the political spectrum, you know, a continuous line with two endpoints, the left and the right, when the reality is that politics are kind of the exact opposite of this. Maybe the whole spectrum idea is just another tool used to divide people, who knows, but the reality is the political spectrum is, is kind of more like a circle than a straight line. So the ultra leftists basically align with the ultra rightists, or in nominal terms, communism and fascism aren't all too different. And the outcome for the people is largely the same, starvation, deprivation, and death. And the 20th century taught us as much. Now here's where things get interesting. The World Economic Forum kept taunting a so-called liberal agenda of global connectivity. But really it's not global at all, is it? Nor is it liberal. I mean, true liberalism is a small government that protects people's liberties. Not a global government that tells you what food you can or cannot eat. That's why as I kept digging into who was actually behind the WEF, that one quote kept coming back to me. I kept seeing these huge global conglomerates and the most powerful politicians in the same room mingling and planning, and it became ever so apparent that Mussolini was right to call fascism corporatism. But one thing still didn't make sense to me. How did Klaus Schwab in the span of a few decades amass all of that power? I mean, how did he get the world's most powerful people in the same room at the same time every year, let alone get them all to agree on a global agenda? That seemed off to me. So I went back to the beginning, to the introduction of the WEF, because I knew I'd missed something. And I had, because I thought that Klaus Schwab had founded the WEF by himself. And whilst technically he had, I had missed the person who had helped him all along, a man named Henry Kissinger. Now, who the hell is Henry Kissinger? And why does he matter? Well, for starters, he is listed as an influence on Klaus Schwab in his Wikipedia page which I thought was quite odd. But who really is Henry Kissinger? Now, according to this official biography, he's a German-born American politician, army surgeon, diplomat, and consultant. He served as a Secretary of State and National Security Advisor under President Nixon and Ford. He also earned a BA in political science from Harvard, where he would go on to meet Klaus Schwab in 1966 and would eventually become Schwab's mentor. And by 1973, he had won a Nobel Peace Prize and remained a key foreign policy player in the 70s. And in 1977, he actually won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. And in 1986, he received the Medal of Liberty. I mean, a pretty impressive guy by all objective metrics, right? Now, as a 99-year-old, he regularly speaks at the WEF. He owns his own diplomacy consultancy, and he's the author of 33 books. The latest one coming out only last year. So it's pretty safe to say that Kissinger remains active in both business and politics. And it's also clear to see that Kissinger was a key influence on Schwab. He helped him in the creation of the WEF and continued being his mentor, as he still is. 
Well, with a guy like that by its side, I mean, maybe the WF isn't too bad after all, right? I mean, surely a Nobel Peace Prize recipient can't possibly have non-peaceful motives. Well, if my investigation has taught me something, it's to never assume. So I kept digging into Henry Kissinger with the goal of finding out who is he really? I'd analyzed dozens of speeches he'd given. I'd perused his most known books and his recent talk at the WF with his closest confidant, Klaus Schwab. So let's have a look at one of his speeches at the WF. Now, during the speech, Kissinger warned of a dilution of confidence in classic economic models, a challenge to the capitalist system, but also noted that a demoralization of the socialist systems, which nowhere have produced the satisfaction of the human personality. And he concluded that all of these changes are global and would make ours a period of turmoil, even apart from any specific challenge that we face. I mean, that sounds rather timely, doesn't it? It kind of sounds like everything else the WF has been saying lately. Only one difference. The speech is from 1980, 43 years ago. Yet their tune hasn't changed one bit. And after I read that, I knew there was more to Kissinger. So I kept digging. Now it turns out this career politician wasn't as squeaky clean as his bio would suggest. And his Global Peace Prize was as riddled with as much controversy as his politics. I mean, he'd been embroiled in scandals like the 1973 Chilean military coup as the Secretary of State where the US interfered with democratic Chilean elections because they didn't align with their objectives. Kissinger was no stranger to undermining democracy and I can see why he fit in so well with World Economic Forum. I mean, he even said, I don't see why we need to stand by and watch a country go communist due to the irresponsibility of its people. The issues are much too important for the Chilean voters to be left to decide for themselves. I mean, that really speaks for itself. He also greenlighted Argentina's military for their dirty war and led US support for Pakistan during the Bangladesh liberation. Pakistan, who were committing genocide, by the way. And there's even a book written about all the alleged war crimes he's committed, which was later turned into a documentary. And he won his Nobel Peace Prize for negotiating a ceasefire in Vietnam. But the ceasefire never even lasted, which is why his prize was so controversial. Kissinger also hid the bombing of Cambodia from Congress. So I can see why Klaus Schwab took a liking to him. And the most interesting fact was this. Kissinger was a Secretary of State under President Nixon. The very same president who got the US off the gold standard the exact same year the World Economic Forum was created by Kissinger's own prodigy. I mean, I'm sure you can start to see how everything really starts to connect here and how there seems to be a few figures pulling the strings from the shadows. Anyways, one specific book that Kissinger wrote really got my attention. It was titled World Order and World Order was truly an insight into Kissinger's mind. And it wasn't pretty. In the book, he writes on the role of government and those in it. The state is a fragile organization and the statesman does not have the moral right to risk its survival on ethical restraint. In his vision for the world, it is a melancholy fact that the countries which are most humanitarian, which are most interested in internal improvement, tend to grow weaker compared to the other countries which possess a less altruistic civilization. But even after I'd uncovered who Henry Kissinger truly was, I still had an unanswered question. What was his role in the Great Reset? And after a few days of immersing myself in this despicable character that is Henry Kissinger, I found this quote that ended up changing the course of my entire investigation. Who controls the food supply controls the people, who controls the energy can control whole continents, and who controls the money can control the world. This whole time I'd been so focused on the money. I thought the Great Reset was all about controlling the money. But there was a much bigger story that was hidden in plain sight. I had completely neglected two other major pillars that play a major role in the Great Reset Plan. Controlling the food and controlling the money. Food. WEF food. The end of meat. The rise of bugs as snacks. What the hell does an organization called the World Economic Forum care about what you eat? What the hell does Klaus Schwab gain from forcing bugs down your throat? And why is meat so bad all of a sudden? So I thought I'd begin by analyzing what the World Economic Forum themselves were saying. It became apparent pretty quickly that the attack on food was underpinned by two things. Climate change and how unhealthy the foods we eat are. And again, they're just trying to save you from yourself. Because of course, the World Economic Forum knows the best. You know, the apparent climate crisis demands that we stop eating meat because it produces 
so much harm for the environment. And as I kept looking into this, I found countless articles saying how horrible meat production is for the environment. But you see, something felt off. I saw back to my investigation in episode one. The puppet masters use crisis to push their own agenda, and every crisis is a unique opportunity. You see, something was off. They're telling you that a few gassy cows are so bad for the climate that we have to stop eating the very thing that sustained us for thousands of years. I don't think so. I mean, surely there had to be more to this story. And there was. It turns out that the US where most of this propaganda came from had a very, very complicated history with food. There are over 30 foods that are available for sale and consumption deemed edible in the US that are actually banned in most of the world. And that didn't sit right with me. I mean, the same people that were saying meat is so dangerous and so bad for the climate were selling you things literally banned in the rest of the world for being too dangerous to eat. And that, my friends, is the puppet master's hypocrisy for you. And these weren't just some niche products that nobody eats. These were household names, staples in the American diet. Products like Skittles, coffee creamer, and even apples. Yes, even apples which are treated with a chemical called DPA which has been linked to various cancers, yet the FDA turns a blind eye. Why? Because they don't actually care about your health or the environment. Otherwise, why would Mountain Dew, one of America's most popular sodas, include brominated vegetable oil, which is used in flame retardants and which the CDC themselves has said leads to memory loss and impaired coordination? Or things like Fruit Loops, which have ingredients proven to lead to the inhibition of cell development, yet nearly every child is fed it in the morning. And the most popular coffee cream or coffee made contains hydrogenated soybean and cottonseed oils. And Skittles contains a dye called Yellow 5 and Yellow 6, just like Twinkies, both of which have been linked to various cancers. Yet these products lie on the shelves of every single American supermarket and no one bats an eye. But me, oh, oh no, you can't eat that. But fake lab-grown meat? Oh, that's not a problem, says the FDA. Upside Foods lab-grown meat is biologically identical to standard meat, but it doesn't require killing animals. Its cultivation process begins with cells extracted from real chickens, which the company grows in tanks with a nutrient mixture that includes fats, sugars, amino acids, and vitamins. The cells mature and multiply according to NPR's Allison Aubrey. The process is similar to brewing beer, but instead of growing yeast or microbes, we grow animal cells, says Uma Valetti, who's Upside Foods founder and CEO. And she told that to CNN earlier this year. But to me, one question still remained. Why is the World Economic Forum incentivized to promote all of these foods? And the answer was a lot simpler than I thought it would be. Every major food producer in the world is partnered to the WEF. But what about fake meat? I mean, they're telling you to stop eating real meat because it's so bad for you in the environment. So surely the alternative is so much better, right? Not quite. Surprise, surprise. The alternative the puppet masters are pushing towards you is just as healthy as the other foods we've mentioned. So let's actually take a look what's in factory made vegan meat. And let's take a look at how the puppet masters would rather you position yourself than the environment. Now here are some of the things you may not know that are in fake meat. The first one, TBHQ, which has been linked to cancer. Second, magnesium carbonate, which is used in fireproofing. The third is red three. Now red three is actually an artificial food coloring. And the FDA banned the use of red three in products such as cosmetics in the 1990s after high doses of the substance were linked to cancer, but it can still be used in foods like, you know, fake meat. Then number four, we have propylene glycol, and it's used as a liquid in e-cigarettes and as the primary ingredient in antifreeze. And fifth, we have ferric orthophosphate, which is used as a pesticide to kill slugs and snails. And what's worse is that there are lab tests showing that six fake meat products, when cooked, tested positive for a carcinogen, acrylamide, so one thing is very clear, the puppet masters don't care about you. But was there actually some truth to the whole climate change argument? Now that question led me down a whole other rabbit hole. I saw all these articles saying how horrible meat was, how much pollution it caused, etc. But how much CO2 and other GHD did it actually emit? Now to find the answer, I decided to go straight to the source. Their source, the Environmental Protection Agency. Now it turns out the UN had been lying all along and all the alarmists were just that, alarmists. 
Now, according to the EPA, transportation accounts for 20% of greenhouse gas emissions and the entirety of the agriculture section, only 11%. And of those 11%, most of them didn't even come from the animals themselves. Only a third of agriculture emissions are actually a product of agriculture. Everything else is just associated with the processes like transportation and energy. And what's more, cows don't even produce more methane than grass. Yes, you heard me correct, grass. So clearly they're sounding the alarm for some other reason. But what could be those reasons? I mean, why? and how are they actually taking control of the food supply? As I began investigating, I came across something unusual, Monsanto. Now what I'm gonna show you is a letter from a retired grass farmer in Arkansas. And this is a letter to the US Department of Justice. Now in the letter, Luan Todd wrote about his concern regarding a company called Monsanto. I am concerned that Monsanto's control of life genes in the form of seeds and their implicated control of production of food in general by the way of built-in pesticide, herbicide, and fertilizer requirements attached to their lines presents a serious threat to the ability of people in the United States and around the world to feed themselves at a price that they can afford. Wait a minute, so this company Monsanto controls the genes of seeds and by extension the food supply? I mean, first of all, who even is Monsanto and are they even related to the Great Reset? Well, let's put a pin in that name and have a look at what Todd actually had to say about them. I see the same thing happening in the agriculture sector that we are seeing in the financial sector. The people who created the problems are being put in positions in the current administration's Department of Agriculture, where they will continue to restrict the rights of farmers and gardeners to pursue food protection independently. The people who created the problems are being put in positions to solve them. I mean, that sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? But this raised another question. What happened in the financial sector that Todd references? Now we'll get back to that in just a second because as I kept reading this letter, I could not believe the quote that Todd had in the next paragraph. To quote Henry Kissinger in 1970, who controls the food supply controls the people, who controls the energy can control whole continents, and who controls money can control the world. Now at first I wasn't sure that this company had anything to do with the Great Reset, but seeing that quote again made me absolutely sure, and also made me realize just how sinister their plot truly is. I don't want any corporation or group of corporations in a position to control people with food. Well, that is exactly what happened. Having read that, I continued to dig into Monsanto and what I found was nothing short of evil. My first question was what the hell was going on with these seeds? Turns out that Monsanto had bioengineered certain kinds of seeds and then had gotten a patent for them. And this patent had actually allowed Monsanto to impose contracts on the farmers who bought the seeds, which forbid farmers from saving the seeds. Now these contracts required farmers to buy new seeds every single year if they wish to continue farming with them. Now not only does this change the way that farming has been done forever, but do you really think that the price of these seeds stayed the same? No, of course not. Monsanto raises their prices by as much as 42% yearly. Now that looks an awful lot like a stock chart. Yet it's the price of seeds since the 90s. So no wonder the small local farmers are getting wrecked when they get strong-armed into contracts by billion dollar companies who have patented seeds. Now, here's where things get really evil. You see, if a farmer is caught using last year's seeds, which they would know because they genetically engineer them to be able to tell, well then Monsanto comes after them with full force. Divide and conquer, the old adage goes. And that's exactly what Monsanto is doing. They're turning farmers onto each other by running a hotline that encourages farmers to snitch on one another. And they even hire retired farmers to try to convince and lure farmers into buying old seeds so that they can be caught and litigated. I mean, it sounds like quite the undercover operation, doesn't it? But that's the length that these immoral companies will go to in order to gain control. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what it always boils down to. Controlling the food, to control the people. Control, control, control. And one judge even called these policies Monsanto's scorched earth policies, referencing to the military strategy of total destruction of enemy resources. Now, here's where it gets even uglier. 
Monsanto will go to the ends of earth to litigate against these local farmers in order to maximize their profits. You see, every single year, Monsanto devotes $10 million of its budget to simply investigate farmers who they suspect are infringing on their contracts, and this practice makes them millions of dollars. I mean, Monsanto takes action against thousands of farmers, settling most out of court. Some would say legal extortion. And from the few that have ended up in court, farmers have had to pay an estimated 100 to $160 million. But ladies and gentlemen, that was really just the tip of the iceberg. The more I looked into Monsanto, the more lawsuits that kept coming up. And they were all tied to their flagship product, a weed killer called Roundup. I mean, as a worm, Monsanto's weed killer has been proven to cause cancer in hundreds of farmers. Now, how had this gone on for so long? I see the same thing happening in the agriculture sector that we're seeing in the financial sector. The people who create the problems are being put in positions in the current administration's Department of Agriculture, where they will continue to restrict the rights of farmers and gardeners to pursue food protection independently. The people who created the problems are being put in positions to solve them. Monsanto's revolving door. But what does that actually mean? Exactly what it says on its face. Monsanto managed to implement their own employees on the very oversight boards meant to protect the farmers and the people. A Monsanto salesman spent years on the Arkansas Board of Agriculture, and a Monsanto VP for Public Policy, Michael Taylor, even became a senior advisor to the FDA commissioner. And Linda Fisher, another Monsanto VP, became the EPA deputy administrator, and Michael Friedman, an FDA deputy commissioner, well, he went on to join Monsanto's clinical affairs division as a VP. And ironically, he now actually leads a cancer center. I guess his conscience caught up with him. So where's Monsanto now? I mean, surely the weed killer is off the market and Monsanto is gone. Not quite. You see, in 2018, Monsanto was acquired for $63 billion by the German pharma and crop science company, Bayer, who of course, are a staple attendee of Davos. So what happened to all of their lawsuits? Luckily, they followed suit. You see, Bayer inherited all of them in a landmark settlement agreement. Bayer actually agreed to pay more than $10 billion to settle thousands of cases. And ironically, right after their acquisition, a jury in California awarded $289 million to a school groundsman whose cancer Monsanto caused and the jury held that Monsanto had failed to warn consumers of the risk. Two months later, another jury awarded $2 billion to a couple for the exact same reason. But the landmark settlement of $10 billion specifically allowed Monsanto to continue selling the product without ever having to add warning labels about its safety. Now, the most recent records indicate that the product grossed Bayer $5 billion in just one year. So whilst $10 billion sounds good, sure, it pales in comparison to how much money Bayer continues to make off a cancerous product. And that's the puppet masters truly at work. To this day, Bayer still has 30,000 suits pending as a result of their poisonous herbicide. This stuff works. So we know how corrupt and evil the agriculture industry has become at the hands of a few companies, but where does that leave the WEF and our fake meat manufacturers? Well, can you guess what organization Bayer is a part of? That's right, the World Economic Forum. But if this was happening with Monsanto, surely there would be other examples, and there were. I began to notice a dire trend. Previously, I had asked, how do the puppet masters control the food? And the answer, through companies like Monsanto and Bayer. You see, for the last 60 years, farmers have been shut out of the market. And this is actually called the farmer squeeze. And it's how the puppet masters have been able to have an iron grip on the food supply. So listen, that was quite a lot. So let's quickly recap here. What's actually happening? I mean, the WEF is telling you that you can't eat meat. Meanwhile, they continue to feed you poison and they continue to consolidate their grip on the market, obliterating competition with their large corporate partners. But that still leaves the question, why? I mean, are the puppet masters just trying to make us unhealthy? I mean, maybe that's part of it for sure, but there must be more. And with all these new food and meat alternatives, there are billions of dollars at stake. And that reminded me of something else that Todd had written in that letter about Monsanto. 
just like the financial sector. Meaning, just like what happens with everything we covered in episode one, big organizations sneakily funding initiatives through under the table agreements and getting rich off it on the back end. So I started to look at who was funding all of this and who was actually getting rich off of it. You see, when Biden took office, the US rejoined the Paris Accord, which was an agreement between UN countries to fight climate change. And a key clause of that was facilitating climate friendly investments. But what really shocked me was the scale of it. The Paris Agreement commits to more than $2.3 trillion in investment every year. And just so you understand, that's six times Apple's yearly revenue, which is the biggest private company on Earth. Now I began to understand why the push towards these climate-friendly meat alternatives were being pushed so heavily. So I continued my investigation to find out who was really getting rich off of this. And what I found shocked me. Now, I had already seen that the food industry was consolidated by a few key players that pretty much controlled the entire industry. And two of these were Cargill and Tyson Foods. And surprise, surprise, both of them are heavily involved in the meat alternative industry, with Tyson launching a global sustainable protein coalition. And who do you think is the biggest shareholder in Tyson? Surprise, surprise, BlackRock. Now, JBS, another major meat producer, even partnered with the WEF to tackle climate change. And as I kept digging, a harsh reality dawned on me. This was never about climate or health to begin with. The very same companies that still make billions selling meat have simply diversified into fake meat. And by now, most of the fake meat industry is controlled by big meat companies. This was about increasing profits and reaping the benefits of trillions of dollars in investment in the name of climate change. And Bill Gates, an investor in many fake meat companies like Beyond Meats and Impossible Foods, even went on the record to say that you can sort of change the behavior of people or use regulation to totally shift the demand. So if they don't nudge you with marketing, they'll just force you to comply and eat fake meat. And as I was looking into the ownership of these fake meat companies, one more name kept popping up. Another triumphant partner of the WEF, BlackRock. So that begs the question, what's BlackRock's role in the Great Reset? But before we get into that, let's discuss who is BlackRock? Well, BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world, managing over eight trillion in assets. And that would make BlackRock the third largest economy in the world, only behind the US and China. You see, BlackRock's economy will be twice that of Germany. But what does that actually mean? It means that BlackRock is invested in and often has some of the highest ownership in basically every major company. And the effect of that is that BlackRock holds tremendous say in the decisions that these companies make and in turn, how the world is even shaped. I mean, BlackRock states that these shares are ultimately owned by the company's clients and not by BlackRock itself, but acknowledges it can exercise shareholder votes on behalf of these clients, in many cases without the client's input. So that's why BlackRock is able to effectuate change that governments couldn't even begin to dream of. And some people even call Larry Fink, BlackRock's CEO, the most powerful man in the world. So when the WEF are talking about public-private partnerships, what they really mean is controlling the public and private sectors through their partners. But how does the WEF ensure such close partnerships on both sides of the spectrum? Well, here's where everything gets really nefarious. And that's due to a little something called the revolving door theory. Now, the revolving door theory is what allows corporations to monopolize in the way that they do. It's what allowed Monsanto's cancerous weed killer to stay on the market. And it's what allows patented GMO seeds to ravage local farmers. And it's even what allows certain experimental jib jabs to be tested on the people. I mean, in essence, the revolving door theory is what underpins all interplay between corporation and the state. I mean, it's really just a fascist's wet dream. And it's the World Economic Forum's wet dream too. The theory states, a revolving door is a situation in which personnel move between roles as legislators and regulators on one hand and members of industries affected by legislation and regulation on the other, analogous to the movement of people in a physical revolving door. Now, the revolving door theory is the puppet master's favorite tool. And there's few corporations who have taken more advantage of it than BlackRock. Introducing Brian Deese, the protector of the new liberal world order. Now, Deese was actually the director of the National Economic Council under Biden, the senior advisor under Obama, and of course, global head of sustainable investing at BlackRock. 
Now, President Biden actually described Brian as having a unique ability to translate complex policy challenges into concrete actions. He has helped steer my economic vision into reality and managed the transition of our historic economic recovery to steady and stable growth. You see, these played a critical role in the passage of key legislation, including the C-19 Relief Bill and the Chips and Science Act and Healthcare and Climate Package. Now, I wonder who benefited the most from C-19? Oh, that's right. BlackRock, who grew to an unprecedented $10 trillion in assets under management during C-19. And in his departure speech from the White House, Dee said, As I look back and I look forward, the thing that I feel the most comforted by is the strength and the equitable nature of this economic recovery in ways that have defied lots of projections and lots of odds. Did you catch that? Equitable nature? We'll come back to that. But it gives a very key insight into the Great Reset. Now let's look at a few other examples of the ever-revolving door between BlackRock and the highest levels of government. Wally Edeyamo, he was the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury, which was the money printing machine, as well as Deputy National Security Advisor. He was also Chief of Staff at BlackRock and was heavily involved in sanctions. Even the United States President is in bed with BlackRock. Shortly before he announced his campaign, Biden met with BlackRock CEO Larry Fink, who jubilantly told Biden he's there to help. Oh, and remember our friend Deese from BlackRock? the protector of the liberal international world order? Well, here's Biden touting the exact same message while speaking at the World Economic Forum. Our careful, and I mean careful attention, to building and sustaining the liberal international world order. You see, ladies and gentlemen, there's plenty more examples of how BlackRock has penetrated the government to their advantage, and it's not just in the US. Philip Hildebrand was head of the Swiss Central Bank and vice chairman of BlackRock. Coincidentally, he's also a prodigy of the WEF rising through the ranks in their Young Global Leaders program. And Stanley Fisher was the deputy MD of the IMF, chief economist of the World Bank, and the eighth governor of the Bank of Israel for nearly a decade. Now, all this is awfully convenient for BlackRock, but things got really sinister when I discovered the connection between BlackRock and the Fed. It turns out that after his tenure at the Central Bank of Israel, Stanley Fisher was the vice chair of the Fed. So let's take it back to August of 2019, specifically August 24th to 26th in France. Months before any pandemic had ever began, the G7 central bankers and finance ministers all met up with a very specific agenda in mind. They called it going direct. It was a plan for how to deal with the next downturn and how they delineated emergency measures for unprecedented challenges. Awfully foreboding, don't you think? We believe an unprecedented response is needed when monetary policy is exhausted and fiscal space is limited. That response could involve going direct, finding ways to get central bank money directly in the hands of public and private sector spenders. We believe policymakers should lay the groundwork for a credible plan to navigate the next economic shock that includes the coordination between monetary and fiscal measures, writes Elga Barch of BlackRock. And just a few months later, that is exactly what happened. Now, who do you think was put in charge to author the Fed's bailout plan following the G7 summit? That's right, BlackRock. Just a month after the central bankers met, the US Fed began their emergency repo loan bailout program months before the pandemic took force. The Fed makes hundreds of billions of dollars a week in loans to the trading floors on Wall Street. In fact, over a size week period at the tail end of 2019, the Fed loaned six trillion dollars to Wall Street. Mind you, this is before the pandemic had even begun. Now, remember in episode one when I mentioned that sometimes organizations with enough power would manufacture entire crisis just to push an agenda and profit on the back end? Well, funnily enough, BlackRock itself confirmed that hypothesis. They recently released a report saying that central banks were indeed purposefully causing crashes in the market. It's always a fun exercise to think that surely BlackRock must have the most advanced tech to predict events and how they'll affect their vast portfolio of assets. Now, at what point do you decide it's more profitable to engineer certain events rather than simply predicting them? I'll leave that thought to you. Anyways, in their plan for the Fed, BlackRock called for blurring the line between fiscal and monetary policy. And by total coincidence, BlackRock was also hired by the Bank of Canada, where their alumni Mark Carney had served as governor prior. Crazy coincidence, no? But it gets worse. 
because BlackRock's plan for the Fed also called on the Fed to go direct and purchase almost a trillion dollars in corporate bonds and ETFs. And conveniently, BlackRock manages some of the world's largest ETFs. And to add even more insult to injury, BlackRock was to get $75 billion in taxpayer money to eat the losses on its corporate bond purchases. 47% of BlackRock's ETF purchases were also purchases of their own ETFs. And funnily enough, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell, well, his own personal assets are also managed by BlackRock. Funny coincidence, huh? And the plan also included helicopter money in the form of stimulus checks. But wait, didn't Biden praise BlackRock's Brian Deese in passing the very act that led to the stimulus check? That's right. Now, who do you think authored this plan then? Our aforementioned friends, Stanley Fisher, Philip Hildebrand, Gene Boyvin, and Elga Barcht. This also begs the question, how does BlackRock square with the WEF? WEF and BlackRock. Well, we know that the WEF has a certain agenda and that they rely on public-private partnerships in order to make their plan work. And we also know that every world leader is a part of Klaus Schwab's cult. And we've just seen how BlackRock is their most important private partner. So it comes as no surprise that Larry Fink and BlackRock actually joined the board of the World Economic Forum and their intentions, well, they couldn't be any more clear. Remember Deese's remarks of an equitable future? Well, that's right on par with the World Economic Forum. You see, we know that the World Economic Forum wants you to own nothing and be happy, but how will they make that happen? How does BlackRock fit into that? Well, the vehicle that will push the Great Reset forward is stakeholder capitalism, which you might remember from episode one. And BlackRock's CEO, Larry Finch, just launched a Center for Stakeholder Capitalism, which will help us further explore the relationship between companies and their stakeholders, and between stakeholder engagement and shareholder value, and will bring leading CEOs, investors, policymakers, and academics to share their experience. And in Larry Fink's annual letter to CEOs, he wrote, Our conviction at BlackRock is that companies perform better when they are deliberate about their role in society and act in the interests of their employees, customers, communities, and shareholders. When we harness the power of both public and private sectors, we can achieve truly incredible things. And this is what we must do to get to net zero. Sounds quite familiar, doesn't it? So what the hell is stakeholder capitalism? You see, it's an entirely new economic system that the World Economic Forum is using to implement the Great Reset. Stakeholder capitalism shifts the responsibility of a company away from their shareholders to the community and other stakeholders. Now, tangibly, the effect of this is that companies are responsible for everyone, but accountable to no one, which means they get to push whatever agendas they want without worrying about their shareholders. And it facilitates exactly what Brian Deese talked about equity. The issue with this regime is that it gives the puppet masters ever more power to act in your best interest however they see fit. And BlackRock is there to make sure that the companies they control will implement the World Economic Forum's stakeholder capitalism. So we covered money in episode one. Now we're covering food, the revolving door theory, as well as BlackRock's immense power. But what about the last part of Kissinger's quote? What about energy? You see, in the fall of 2022, the energy crisis in Europe began, which later morphed into the cost of living crisis. The cost of living crisis is fueled by two things, inflation making everything expensive, as well as high energy costs trickling down. Now, we've already discussed how the puppet masters use inflation to control the masses and enrich themselves, but what about energy? What caused the energy crisis in Europe? Now, before we get into that, let's recall the theme of the first episode. The puppet masters using crisis to further their agenda. And that's exactly what they've done with the energy crisis. In their move towards a green and sustainable future, Germany decided to decommission their nuclear energy plants, which made them entirely reliant on natural gas from Russia. And more than just being a dubious foreign policy decision, this put the entire continent in jeopardy. Sure enough, when the puppet masters' next crisis broke out, the war in Ukraine, and the natural gas pipeline mysteriously burst. Europe was basically fucked. And the effect? Exorbitant energy prices. And who bears the cost of that? It's the people, either directly or indirectly with even higher inflation as the government spends more. And the outcome? Well, it's another crisis the World Economic Forum can exploit as they move to even more renewable energy sources, knowing damn well that it was the move to these 
that started the crisis to begin with. War over energy resources has riddled history. I mean, just have a look at the Middle East and US foreign policy over the last few decades. And now is no different. But this time they're using the crisis for more than resources. They're using the crisis to change our world and tell us how we ought to live. The World Economic Forum just released their global risk report. And top of the list for the next two years, cost of living crisis, also dubbed the energy and inflation crisis. And top of the list for the next decade, failure to mitigate climate change. In the last few weeks, they have really taken their agenda to the next level. Do you remember the Paris Agreement and how $2.3 trillion was pledged yearly to green investments? Well, the Prime Minister of the UK just took things to another level, putting that pledge to shame. At the last conference where he praised Mark Carney for his work and announced three new measures, including rewiring the entire financial global system. You see, two years ago, Carney unveiled a $130 trillion pledge for climate finance. So now you can see the incentive structures that are pulling the strings behind the scenes. We want to require the entire financial system for net zero. So now the puppet masters are using energy and energy transitions to gain even more control. At the World Economic Forum, they are already talking about managing energy demand and what does that actually mean? It means they will choose when and what you can use your electricity for. And once that happens, your sovereignty will be long gone. But how does BlackRock fit into the whole energy crisis? The answer is Ukraine. You see, the energy crisis was caused in large part by the war in Ukraine. And remember in episode one, how the puppet mashes got rich off of playing both sides of the fence? Well, this case, of course, is no different from that. You see, the puppet masters get to use the energy crisis to further their agenda, and they get rich off of war. Again. And who's our prime suspect? BlackRock. You see, some of BlackRock's biggest holdings include key defense contractors for the DOD. And who else gets rich off of wars other than the bankers? Well, of course, the companies that make the weapons. And who gets rich off of that? Their shareholders. You see, BlackRock is the third largest shareholder in Lockheed Martin, and the fifth largest in Boeing, the two biggest winners of defense contracts. But what's more, didn't we say that the puppet masters get rich off of both sides of the war? They do, but in the case of Russia and Ukraine, they got a little bit more creative because they couldn't arm the Russians, so instead BlackRock is getting rich off of arming Ukraine and rebuilding it. You see, in September of last year, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, met with BlackRock CEO Larry Fink and struck a deal for BlackRock to be in charge of rebuilding the country. A deal worth hundreds of billions. But surely BlackRock can spend their money as they please, right? Same with Ukraine. Well, that would be true if they were spending their own money, but Ukraine, well, it doesn't have any money. So they will spend US tax dollars and give them right back to BlackRock, just like a perfectly revolving door. And Henry Kissinger even said that the conflict in Ukraine can permanently restructure the global order. And we've seen it time and time again, they use crisis to further their agenda. And this time is no different. Whether it's about Ukraine or energy transitions, the end game is always the same. But as I was uncovering all the players behind the scenes, I had one central question in mind. How would the puppet masters control all the money pledged to fight climate change? I mean, after all, tracking $130 trillion isn't all that easy. But that's when I discovered something new. A plot to control money to agree I hadn't even thought to be possible. And who is leading the charge on this authoritarian initiative? Well, the secret organization that controls 95% of the world's GDP, of course. And that's when things took a turn and became even more sinister. 